just want to thank you for all your prayers for me. Um, I feel so much better, and I'm so, I miss you guys, and I'm so glad to be back. Um, keep thinking of your friends and your loved ones who have COVID, um, and keep lifting them up in prayer. Um, we gather every Sunday to give, to sing, to listen to the word, and to respond. And those are all aspects of our worship service, and we are so glad you're here with us this morning. Um, if anyone's in the parking lot, good morning and hello. If anyone is joining us online, good morning and hello, and thank you for tuning in. We're going to begin this morning by singing Glorious Day, so please stand and worship with us.
Good morning, everyone. That truly will be a glorious day, won't it? Just a few announcements this morning. Uh, First, I'd like to welcome everyone here for this worship service. If you are a first-time visitor uh, with us, we would love to get get to know a little more about you. There are uh, little blue cards in the pews uh, in front of you. Please feel free to share your contact information with us. Uh, so that we can pray for you and pray with you. Uh, Also, if you have specific prayer requests that you'd like to share uh, with the church, uh, please feel free to share those with the, on the blue card. Uh, The pastor and staff will pray uh, for the visitors and for your prayer requests uh, specifically. So, welcome. Uh, Just a few announcements this morning in your bulletin. There is a called church conference on Wednesday, August 24th at uh, 7 p.m. Agenda for that conference will be available on August 14th, both in the church and by email uh, on request. We will be having a uh, service for deacon ordination and installation on Sunday, August uh, 28th. Uh, You'll see in your bulletin that we will be um, installing three Uh, Deacons, Gail Clark, Jackie Inscore, and Rich Lovegreen, Uh, they will be ordained on that day. Uh, So please uh, plan to be here for that uh, special uh, time. Um, The Deacon Bereavement Team is looking for team members. Um, This will help uh, share uh, in uh, sharing the the glory of Christ as uh, families and members um, experience uh, grief uh, through the passing of a loved one. If you feel led to serve in that capacity, please uh, contact Ellen Anderson. Her number is listed uh, there in the bulletin. And I'd like to share with you that we would really enjoy your prayers specifically for the Child Enrichment Center Uh, The CEC is experiencing a shortage of teachers and staff. Uh, They are in the process of interviewing uh, for teachers and assistant teachers and substitutes. There is a great need there. Your prayers can absolutely uh, influence uh, the staffing of that uh, ministry here at Highland. So um, please uh, keep them in your prayers as they go through that. Uh, process. They're looking for teachers in all classrooms, uh, and so it may be you're willing to share uh, your time to be a teacher or a substitute, or you know someone who is. At the very least, you can share your prayers uh, for that. Uh, So please keep that in mind during your prayer time. One last announcement. Uh, I was asked, there have been requests for uh, printed photo directories. Please uh, contact Terry in the office. She'll be happy to get you a printed photo directory. Uh, Several months ago, we took pictures of families and individuals uh, here at the church to include in that. If for some reason you weren't available to have your picture taken uh, for that or you you would like to share a picture uh, to be included in that, let Terry know uh, and she can uh, take care of that for you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, Truly will be a glorious day when uh, we are lifted up to you uh, in heaven. But it's a glorious day here, Lord, today as we are gathered together to share in this worship service. We ask, Lord, that we worship you in uh, praise and uh, joy. And as we are hearing the sermon uh, and the scriptures, we ask, Lord, that you will open our hearts uh, and bless us with your love 
uh, and that we lift ourselves up to you for your use here in this community to glorify you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let's worship through our scripture reading this morning. We have four sets of verses for you. The first coming from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. From Luke chapter 23, verse 43. And from Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. May the Lord bless the reading of his scripture. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I God, how I need you. For sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found, is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I comes my way 
When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we worship you this morning through the act of the giving of our tithes and offerings, we ask that you bless these gifts in a way that will glorify you both in this church and in our community. And yes, Lord, in this world. Help these resources to help us go out and share our story of our faith in Christ to our neighbors, to our friends, to our family, so that they can also share your love for them. In Christ's name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, singers. I love hearing the harmony. Don't you all like hearing the harmony? Thank you. I I always try to pick out the various parts and enjoy that. If you all like the harmonies, Come and sing with them. I got them, didn't I? Uh, about a month, I think, a choir will start uh, for Christmas. They're already meeting and singing every second and fourth Sunday, but uh, about a month they'll start uh, rehearsing um, for, for Christmas, sometime in September, right? Well... I'm on a real exciting topic today, based on the questions that have been asked. Uh, This one's about death. (laughs) Exciting. It's not actually about death itself, although I'm going to talk very briefly about that in passing, but it's about what happens after death. You go, well, of course we know that, right? What happens after death? We know that. Or do we? Because, as Mark read earlier, just like Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. But in Philippians, one of Paul's earliest letters, it says, when Jesus comes, then the dead will rise and be changed. How does that work? So let me ask you a couple questions. Who believes he or she will die? Wait a minute, there's a few. I didn't see every hand up here. (laughs) It's okay. Who wants to die? Same, similar sign, right? Nobody, everybody, nobody. Who is ready to die? That should be pretty much all of us. At least anybody who believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior should be ready spiritually to die. Now, there are some other things that we should do in preparation for our death because it is inevitable. (laughs) There's only two people that I am aware of recorded in Scripture that did not die. 
Even Jesus died. That was planned. Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more. Right? Go back. I think it's uh, fifth chapter of Genesis. Don't hold me to that. Uh, and Elijah. Elijah was carried up in the chariots, the horses and chariots of fire. What a way to go. Forget laying down and going to sleep and not waking up. I want to go in chariots of fire. <laughs> but we all know we're going to die and we all should be ready, spiritually speaking, we all should be ready. We all should know for certain that I have a faith relationship with Jesus Christ that while we can't prove it, it should be obvious in our life. It should be demonstrated. I've known some pretty good people before who didn't believe in Jesus Christ. But we should be a little different. We also need to plan. Don't, don't get me wrong. We need to plan by having wills, power of attorney, medical power of attorney. What do you want to have happen when you're at the end of life? And do you want to go on all these tubes and machines or do you just want to die? All those sorts of things. You need to discuss those with family members. If spouse, if you still have one, have one or a uh, larger family. If you need to, you need to have your finances in order. They need to know how to get those things, right? We can get all those things to prepare. But I'm not talking about that today. What happens? What happens when we die? Well, physically, we know what happens when we die, right? When somebody dies, right? They're either cremated or they're put in a casket, and nowadays you got to have um, a vault to put it in the ground and all that kind of stuff. Um, we know that happens to the physical body, that it no longer houses. They are. It's very clear. Jesus said in Luke 23, 43 to the, to the man on the cross, he didn't have time to prove it with his actions. He didn't have time to get baptized. He just said, Lord, have mercy on me. And Jesus said, today you'll see me in paradise. Amen. Luke 23, 43, read earlier today. But the question then arises as we look at this 1 Thessalonians passage, verse 4, chapter 4, and it, and it says very clearly, this, by the way, um, is from, from chapter 4, verse 13, into verse, uh, chapter 5, verse um, 11, actually, uh, because they repeat the same idea, encourage one another uh, in this case. But this is one of Paul's earliest letters. There's some debate about that, but it's one of his earliest letters. And it's one of his simplest and clearest explanations, obviously inspired by God, the Holy Spirit. And he wrote it down for us. So here's what it says. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. Dead. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, those who have already died. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Hold on there just a minute. Paul expects Jesus to come back literally any moment. And while we, most of us, will go, yeah, Jesus could come back at any time. How many of you really expect we who are alive until Jesus comes back? How many of you expect that to happen? How many of you live like that? Like, Jesus is coming tomorrow. 
or this afternoon. Let's go on. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Do you remember, by the way, what happened when he was taken up into heaven? In Acts chapter 1, they're staring in the sky and two men in white come to him and say, Hey, you see what he did? He's coming back like that. Just like that. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the ark of an archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Next. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Dead in Christ, rise. Given that new body, which doesn't say all of that in here, we rise, meet Him, we're transformed, given that resurrection body, and we're going to be with Him always. And because He's talking to people who are going, wait a minute, Paul, you told us that we wouldn't die, that Christ was coming back, and yet some had fallen asleep. He's saying, with those words that I just said, encourage one another. Encourage one another with these words. And then he goes on and says some more in chapter 5, but we are not going to read all that. And he closes it by basically the same words. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. So, what really happens? Let me start by answering, and, and this is going to be rapid fire, because uh, I want to get to the meat of this, but why do Christians die in the first place? Why do we die? Why not just... Enoch and Elijah just taken up and are no more. Sometimes we think, well, we die because we're being punished for our sin. No, we are not specifically being punished as Christians and therefore dying. However, because sin entered the world, death entered the world. So it's not because of any sin I'm doing that I'm getting sick or dying, but it's because sin and the decay it brought in so death is not the final outcome of we who are living, but we are living in a fallen world. So it is an outcome. God uses the third thing I want to say. So first one is it's not punishment. Second one is we're part of a fallen world. The third thing I want to say is it helps complete the process of sanctification and then what's called glorification. <clears throat> when we except Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are justified. I've told you before, that means just if I'd never sinned. Justified. We're made right in God's sight through His righteousness, actually. My defense and my righteousness doesn't come from anything I've done, but from what Jesus has done for me. And so then, as we are, our sanctification is completed and we are glorified, then we become one with Christ. So that's two sides of that one coin. And the last thing, whether we die a long life at old age or whether we die a martyr's death, obedience to God is more important than preserving our life to live a long time. Does that make sense? It's more important to follow Christ. And if that means imprisonment or death, which particularly for some of the younger ones, we don't know what's going to happen in this country or this world with Christians, but living for God is more important than living on this earth. So that's some things. Now, what does the Bible not say about what happens after death and before Jesus comes back? You ever heard of this thing called purgatory? <coughs> purgatory. It's that state taught primarily by the Roman Catholic Church where people are between death and being good enough to make it to heaven. And we've got to pay penances, got to live there long enough or be prayed out. Am I right? Those of you who know enough about Catholic, where's Ellen when I need her, right? She's one of them. But need to be prayed out of purgatory and into heaven. That is nowhere in our Bible. 
It is in the Catholic Bible. Now, wait a minute, Frank. <laughs> okay. The Catholic Bible has more books in the Bible than we do. How many books in the Bible do we have? 66. 66 books in the Bible. The Catholics have, a, I, and I didn't go count them this week, I should have, but they have about a dozen more. Why is that? Ours come, our Old Testament comes from the Hebrew manuscripts. Their Old Testament comes through a guy named Jerome who translated the Vulgate. Have you ever heard of that? The Vulgate, it's the, the Greek into Latin. And they use Greek texts which have a few more books of the Bible, including Tobit and Esdras and Maccabees, just to name a few. And the idea of purgatory and actually of praying for the dead come from 2 Maccabees chapter 12. Go look it up. There are actually some interesting books and have some, some neat stuff, but not in my, my, my view on the same level as Scripture that has been held tight throughout all of history. So we don't have purgatory. There's no need then to pray for the dead. They're dead. It's done, right? Whether they're here or here or in heaven or hell, wherever exactly that might be. We, praying for somebody after they've died is too late. A third thing that the Bible does not teach is what's called soul sleep. Now you heard me read from 1 Thessalonians 4 that maybe they have gone to sleep. Well, that's a nice little euphemism for death. It's not that they are just kind of in a soul sleep, just hanging, in, hanging out for a while until Jesus comes back. No, these people have passed away. They have died. Uh, Roman Catholics and some Lutherans also had something called limbo. You ever heard of limbo? They're in limbo. They're in this, uh, this state um, that is between death and, and uh, what comes next. It's waiting until Jesus comes back. But that isn't in the Bible clear either. <laughs> what happens is that when we die, as Jesus said on the cross... We are ushered into heaven to be with God. Paradise. Heaven. I don't know about you, but that's pretty comforting. We'll get to that in a little bit. But those who don't believe are not ushered into heaven. They're ushered into heaven. But it's not with our resurrection bodies, and we'll get to that. So, um... Death comes, it's a natural outgrowth of the fallen nature of the world, and the Bible does not teach a lot of the things that we hold on to, including a lot of people in this world hope that it's just the end, right? You ever heard? Just annihilation, just when, the, when I die, that's it. And there'll come a time when there's nothing left at all, and um, that's not what Um, it's pretty obvious Jesus is talking to, to people about a variety of things. It's a long section in, in the red letters. <laughs> you know what those are? And, and, and he says, tells this story. He said, now, there was a poor man, a beggar, who used to go to the, to the gates of the temple and he would beg. People would come in and go in to worship and he would beg. And the dogs would lick his sores, and he was always hungry, and he never had enough, and all those sorts of things. But there was also this rich man, <coughs> and he lived in his uh, nice big house with his purple robes and all the good foods and feasts, and, and, and they both died. 
Lazarus went straight to heaven. Actually gives a good Hebrew or Jewish illustration. He went to be to rest on the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man went to hell. Burning in eternal fire. Very clear from Jesus' word. We'll get to that next week when we talk more specifically about hell. But it wasn't die and kind of go into limbo or hang in there immediately. Die heaven, die hell. And it's separated. We can't go back and forth. Lazarus can't even go back and tell his brothers, right? If you know that story very well. He's going, well, please send him back to tell my brothers. Can't do that. When we die, our spirits, our souls, it's not super clear there, go one place or the other. So in short, there is an eternal blessing for the righteous beginning at the point of death or eternal punishment for the wicked. Our spirits will be ushered immediately into our eternal dwelling. And then when Jesus returns, we will be given that resurrection body, which is what is said in, um, in 1 Thessalonians. When Christ comes back, we will rise. He will give us our bodies. Now, there's an aspect of time, and this time sometimes gets into question. Is God bound by time? No, not really. God stands outside of time. When Jesus took the flesh, took on flesh, he was bound by time. But God is eternal. This is my way of understanding it. When we leave time, by death, we enter eternity. And in the twinkling of an eye, in the flash, things change in my understanding of things. Is that super clear from Scripture? No. Okay, I'm just telling you. The, the man that I have been reading and holding on to primarily, although I read three different systematic theology books on these subjects, not to mention a lot of Scripture, Wayne Grudem... <clears throat> believes that when Jesus comes back, that we will be reunited with some aspect of the physical body that was put in the grave or dropped over sea if you were in the Navy and died or cremated, that somehow we will be reunited. I believe that we will be given a new tent, the Bible talks about, that is a resurrection body that is fit for heaven or hell. And as he wrote so clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, go read that if you want to see what that body is like. It is like the fish in the water have a body, the birds in the air have a body, we on the earth have a body. When we get to heaven, we'll have a body that is fit for that environment, that eternal dwelling. So when we die, our spirit goes straight to heaven but the final glorification, justification, sanctification, glorification, I'll explain that in a minute. That final glorification, when Christ comes back, we are given our resurrected body to encompass the spirit for all of eternity. Now you're going, what difference does that make? Well, we are justified. We live a life becoming more and more like Christ, more and more holy sanctification, which just means holy fight. 
And when Christ comes back in the final bell is told, so to speak, on existence as we know it. Just like the heavens and earth are completely renewed, so is our body. We're given our body. So what difference does that make? Very simple. Are you saved? If so, regardless of all the little details, that should bring you great joy. When I die, I'll be with, heaven, with God. When He comes back, in the twinkling of an eye, I will be given my resurrection body for all of eternity. When a Christian family member, close friend, church member, when a Christian dies, there's great joy, but also great sorrow. Right? It's a bittersweet thing. But Paul himself said, don't grieve like those who have no hope. For we have hope, he says, and Christ is going to come back and those who have already fallen asleep will be, will be raised and reunited with Christ. I have some concerns about some friends, even family members. It wasn't long ago I was talking to, to someone and I, I was just really concerned and I was trying to get, get over to spiritual matters and finally the person brought up, well, anytime I go like to the doctor or somewhere else, I try to bring up Jesus. And I was like, yes, that's a good word. It's a good word. Now I've got to go back and figure out, okay, what exactly do you mean by bringing up Jesus? You know, A lot of times we'll talk about God. God's great. But we aren't saved through, if I can say it, a God or God the Father. We're saved through Jesus Christ. So we can't just talk about God. It's a high percentage of America. It's declining, but there's still a, more than a majority. More than 50% still believe in God. But not very many believe in Jesus. And the Bible. So, believing that when we die, we will no longer experience the pain and suffering that this body and this earth brings, but we will be ushered into heaven, that should give us great joy. And for those who don't know the Lord, it should give us a boldness to go and tell them now. Because what do we do at a Christian's funeral? We talk about their life. How they love the Lord and those sorts of things. But what do we do when you have someone that's not a Christian? You've probably been to those funerals and you're going, who are you talking about? You know what I'm saying? Who are you? That person was evil or wicked. And you're coming up with all kinds of good things. Yes, if they've done something good, talk about it. But be honest. Whether or not God is going to actually reconstruct some sort of physical body from the decomposed, scattered remnant molecules of our dead bodies, or whether He's going to give us a completely new tent, that doesn't matter to me. Does it to you? The Bible is clear that when we die, we go to heaven, to be with Jesus, and at the right time, He will give us a body to live forever. How about that? Can we live on that? Amen. Let us pray. Father, thank you. There are a lot of holes in 
our understanding of all this, but God is pretty clear at those two things. That when we die, we go to that body fit for that place forever. That we can enjoy all of the blessings there with an imperishable body. One raised in glory and power, a spiritual body that will be like Jesus' body. So God, we give you praise. We thank you. Brings us great joy. Both for the end of our lives as well as those we know who are facing more imminent death. But also it gives us a great sense of urgency, Lord, to go tell the world that Jesus saves. In your name we pray. Amen. In the meantime, we need to walk with Jesus, live with Him. If you'd like to pray or come down by yourself, pray or have me pray with you, I'd be happy to do that. Let's stand and sing this together.
these four will be good 